Hey, Big A, it's your day. And we've all come to celebrate. Gathered here to praise you for your 90 years of life. We have nearly 400 people here today for this party, and I'm well aware of the risk involved in trying to single out individuals to be recognized. But I am willing to take that chance because we're only going to really introduce four people from four groups. All of you are so important. I look out here and I see so many friends that Bonnie and I have made. And what's amazing is that your contributions to this university go back 30 years or more. And so there's been a bridge between Dr. Dorn and, mm -hmm. and the other presidents and myself. We will introduce former presidents, former governors, former congressmen, and members of our General Assembly. First, he was our friend as governor, and he later served on the Board of Regents at a very critical time in the history of this university, and now in continuous in his service on the Board of UK. Please welcome Governor Edward Ned Breathitt. Ned, would you please? <laughs> This man, and I haven't seen him, so I hope he's here. <laughs> uh, this man also helped us in many ways during his time in the governor's office, including the funding of the Folk Art Center and, the, and Lappin Hall project. I was pleased to award him an honorary doctorate. Please welcome Governor and Mrs. Jones. I hope she's, they're here. If they're going to be here. When they come, we're going to clap. Also a, a former governor who I've met a few times and also served on that board at a very uh, critical time. Uh, please, Governor Louis Nunn. Governor Nunn. In addition uh, to our guests of honor, we have two former presidents of the university here today. Well. Governor, I've introduced you, so they're going to clap while you find your seats right up here in front. People told me you always could make a great entrance, I'll tell you. <laughs> also here today, we have uh, two former presidents. First, uh, please give our welcome to President Emeritus and Mrs. Nelson Grody. Nelson. And also a very wise man that I seek counsel from from time to time, President Emeritus and Mrs. A.D. Albright. We're also proud that uh, Three of our good friends and loyal alumni in the General Assembly are here today, and I haven't seen any of them, so we're down to two, but I don't know which two. Uh, uh, John Will Stacy, there he is. Uh, Senator Blevins, Walter Blevins. Uh, John Will and Walter have citations that they would like to present to Dr. Dorn at this time. Uh, I came to Moorhead uh, from West Liberty. 
and met one of the greatest presidents that Moorhead's ever had, one of the finest people uh, that ever had the opportunity to be around. And by this assembly of this crowd shows how special this gentleman is and his wife. Uh, Dr. Dorn, I was the majority leader a few weeks back, and uh, <laughs> I'm going to have to ask for some help so I can get back in the majority. Uh, Louis, I'm not going to take your advice, join your party. I'm not going to do that. Uh, <laughs> but it is an honor to be here today and to honor this great uh, individual. I do have a citation from the Kentucky Senate. Uh, the Senate of the Commonwealth of Kentucky, to all to whom these presents shall come, greetings. Know ye that Adrian Dorn, born September 1st, 1909, is afforded sincere congratulations upon the, uh, on this auspicious occasion of his 90th birthday. A former Speaker of the Kentucky House of Representatives and President Emeritus of Morehead State University, serving as President from April 1954 to December 1976, he is widely considered to be the father of modern-day Moorhead State University and continues to support the university to this day. Though currently retired, this Church of Christ minister of 28 years is still actively lecturing, writing, researching, and occasionally preaching. I think that's preaching all the time, but they misprinted that there. Uh, in celebration of this mem memorial uh, event, this honorable body joins with his lovely wife, Manon, in commending him for a life lived to the fullest and for the vitality of heart which has brought him thus far. Adrian Dorn to extended utmost birthday greetings on this notable day and on the motion of Senator Walter Blevins and Senator Robert Stivers and signed by the President as President Larry Saunders. Congratulations. Dr. Dorn, it's an honor to be here in your honor today. And uh, so, don't go, don't go from preaching to meddling. So, <clears throat> Dr. Dorn, you know you've always been one of my favorites. You know that. I'd like to uh, read this citation of the House of Representatives of the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Hereby offers its sincere congratulations to Dr. To Dr. Adrian Dorn upon his uh, uh, auspicious occasion of his 90th birthday. As president of Moorhead State University, Dr. Dorn had the longest tenure of any uh, of the former presidents. Serving as Speaker of the House in 1950, his, this distinguished Graves County native is also a former president of the Kentucky uh, Education Association and a former newspaper editor. Now I know why you meddle a little bit. In addition, uh, MSU is creating an endowment in his honor in the College of Education and Behavioral Sciences for his service as a high school teacher, coach, and principal. In celebration of this memorable event, the entire membership of the House of Represent Representatives, and join, uh, represent, uh, Representatives joins me on, this, on commending you for a full and vital life, Dr. Dorn. This distinguished body hereby extends its best wishes to you on this meaningful occasion of your 90th birthday. Congratulations, Dr. Dorn. Uh, seated up here beside me today is uh, a woman who uh, we've been married for 37 good years and We've been married 37 years, so there were no bad ones. Uh, I consider to really her to be the consummate wife and mother and now grandmother. And I found out here in the last few weeks that she is an excellent demanding nurse, my wife, Bonnie. <laughs> I invite Dr. Don Flatt, Professor Emeritus of History, to offer our invocation. Don. Let us bow. Eternal God, Father of us all, thank you for bringing together today all of us in such a manner that this event can take place. We're pleased to gather on this same hallowed spot where over a hundred years ago, almost to the day, this institution opened its doors. 
As we return for this lovely homecoming weekend, we praise you for the amazing difference our alma mater has made by constantly furnishing a light to the mountains and transforming the sounds of gunfire in the long ago from a feud into the tiny whisper of pages being turned this very moment in library books constantly opening up a new world to our students. Thank you for the influence of one institution which has inspired countless young people to successful lives of service and wisdom, and justice, and love. How wonderful to have as today's speakers, three individuals whose lives more than adequately exemplify the success of our thousands of graduates. In a most special way, we're privileged to honor an individual, oh God, who along with his gracious first lady, took giant footsteps across the commonwealth to lead this institution to many of its most glorious triumphs. Thank you for granting Dr. Doran a lifetime of willpower, culminating today in sufficient energy and determination to overcome the impossible in order not to miss this event. And how glorious to have on the program the woman who stood by his side as a helpmate to make decades of service to this institution possible. Thank you for enabling our present leader and our first lady to bless us with their presence today in spite of adverse circumstances. Oh God, we're grateful that we can come here and honor you, this institution, and this wonderful couple today. Thank you for sharing with us President Eaglin and for the talent, compassion, and humanity of him and his first lady, along with Dr. Doran and Manon, who've touched our lives sufficiently for 23 years to make us want to return today to celebrate his 90th birthday with major contributions to the institution to which the Dorans gave their total commitment. Thank you for giving them 23 additional fulfilling years thus far since their retirement. We realize that life is so uncertain. Sometimes it seems more so for some than for others. And please care for everyone here in such a manner that each one can return to celebrate AD 100. And now, eternal God, provider of all good things, thank you for this food and the atmosphere of this special occasion. And while we eat and fellowship together as one big happy family, bless us with precious memories of what you have accomplished here in this corner of your world so that the far-reaching dreams of others who follow can build on the shoulders of those committed men and women who've laid such a solid foundation thus far. In his name, amen. Please enjoy your lunch.
Governors, distinguished guests. It's very emotional for me. Moorhead's a very special place to me, and Nani and Adrian are parents. I can't say grandparents, I'm too old for that. <laughs> Happy birthday. I was thinking when Don Flatt spoke of love, service, justice, and wisdom, because what I was going to lead with was happy birthday, friend, role model, mentor, leader. As a friend, that friendship has lasted. He was one of the first people I met when I came to this campus. You and Nani were always out there greeting the students. I was transferring in from UK, miserable at a big institution. My father said, I told you, Yana gone to a decent one like Moorhead. <laughs> My father's uh, mother and father are both Moorhead alums too. And um, that friendship has continued to this minute through the annual Christmas events and the wonderful musicales or when I'm walking into a post office in Lexington, I hear, Virginia, I know who it is. Role model. What you taught all of us, everything from posture to grooming to above all balance in life, the importance of family, the importance of community, the importance of commitment, and what a mentor you were. I mean, it, I don't know whether college presidents do this today or not, but I stopped by. Dr. Doran called me into his office sometime during my senior year. And he said, you know, Jenny, you better remember one thing. The IQ is important. He said, but of all the cues that you better remember most, it's the gratitude quotient, the GQ. He said, that'll hold you in better stead. He said, there are more smart people, more talented people who don't know how to say thank you. He said, if you remember to say thank you, it will set you apart as a human being in most walks of life. And that's probably the most important. It's the advice of all the advice, and boy, people give me advice because I need it, um, that I've ever gotten that was probably the most valuable. And as a leader, Dr. Doran, you know, I get so amused. Think what you will about the press. There is this hot thing now called civic journalism. They suddenly discovered that you need to be involved in the community to write about it. Old-fashioned newspaper publishers have known that for years, but we forgot it for a few years in this country. As a leader, you were a civic leader. You raised money for the St. Clair. I mean, you were in every civic club in town. You ran the university. You were an active part of the civic life, you and Nani both, at the state level and at the local level. Political? You bet. You taught me that it, politicians are there to do what the people need. Politics isn't a dirty word. Politics is what makes life run in civic, in, in the government. That's it. It's politics. It's compromise. It's trade. It's changes. Good Lord knows Louis Nunn and Ned Breathitt and, and Governor Jones and Walter Blevins know that. And you taught me, though, and it's held me in good stead to respect politicians, to respect what politics can do. And academia. Dear doctor, the importance of feeding the intellectual life, the importance of supporting academics, and last but far from least, 
You were a minister. You dealt with the spiritual side, and you forced your students to deal with the spiritual side of life, and you weren't at all ashamed of it. It may have been politically incorrect today, but it's held a lot of us in very good stead. It helped me to join Governor Jones in his quest to have religion, not not ideology, but religion, reintroduced to schools. It made it a lot more comfortable. You and Nani made it the thing to do. And I guess there's two people, they say the apple doesn't fall very far from the tree. And one of the people that I think you mentored, and I think you're prouder of your people than you are of yourself. You and Nani both would rather brag on your kids than yourselves. And there's something a lot of people in this group probably don't know is about the impact of what I think is probably your star student, Terry McBrayer. And I was thinking we've all been teasing Terry, telling bad stories about him for his bride. But the honest fact of the matter was, and this was a kind of integrity, and I have to believe Terry learned it from you. I don't know his family, but I believe he learned it from you. When I took, K e took over KET, uh, we were not doing much public affairs programming. Comment on Kentucky was it. We were not doing election night coverage. We were really not into contemporary life. Did a lot on history, a lot on music, a lot on culture. Terry really insisted, and thanks to Terry, we have election night coverage that is the premier one in the state. The commercial stations all work with us. The other thing we have is several public affairs programs, but the mark of that man who had sufficient political power to do whatever he wanted to do, no matter how insulated we were with one of the top politicians in the state as our board chairman, he had a pretty free reign, and you know what? He didn't use it. Never once, and I thought he had to have learned that from Adrian Doran. He gave us leadership and he fought with us to get more on the air involving civic and public life. But he drew that line between programming and outside influence tighter than any chairman before or since, and it set the pace. And it is made you know about academic freedom. Terry McBrayer set the tone for editorial independence and editorial integrity in a way that it, 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 Lynn Press believed it and felt it deeply. I'm not saying it hadn't been there before, but never had a chairman taken it on as a cause to set it. And um, I think you all take credit for that and for you do mighty nice work as I look out over this group. Very special work, and last but far from least, about what I want to thank you for, because I am a landowner in this region, and that's creating the middle class. This university, as you built it, and as people like Ron Eaglin and Bonnie are carrying on and, and progressing it, have assured that we will not have just the very wealthy and the very poor, but we will have educated people who value education so that it doesn't all fall to Alpha Hutchinson to do, so that there are other leaders and that there is, there is abundant and sufficient money to grow the economy of this region. And I think that, my dear Dr. Doran, is fully the kind of pace what you've set. And for that, I am eternally grateful. I love you. I thank you for all that you and Nani did. Victor sends his deep regrets. He had a conflict, but he did allow me to say that I could meet with the plan giving director <laughs> to talk about your endowment. <laughs> and so he did give me permission to do that. And that was my, that it was one, one argument that there was never a question when, I, when it was mentioned. Vic said, oh yes, we must do that. Thank you, dear doctor. Happy birthday, and I can't wait till the hundredth. Thank you, Jenny. I heard a president say recently that he didn't go anywhere without his lawyer. And today, I'm following that advice. Please welcome Terry McBrayer. Terry, don't speak. 
Istanbul. All right. <laughs> uh, Dr. Eaglin, thank you, and Jenny, thank you for those very warm, kind remarks. Uh, I am delighted to be here. I'm, I've got to say very quickly that Jenny and I had a little different experiences with Dr. Doran when he was president. He called me into his office also many times, but it wasn't to teach me to say thank you. <laughs> 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 I am delighted to be here with so many dear friends, and you know who you are over the years. Some of you have heard part of the remarks I'm going to say today, but I want to say them again. Almost 44 years ago, a frightened, relatively poor, eager, insecure, enthusiastic young man with a terrible East Kentucky, coming from a small Northeast Kentucky town called Greenup along with 300 other freshmen enrolled at this school and heard the following talk given by a man that history would later record as being one of the outstanding and dynamic leaders of Kentucky in the 20th century. The young man hearing that talk was greatly influenced by the new college president and his wife. Their support and encouragement would become a dominant and guiding influence over that student's life, both personally and professionally. Talk went something like this. As president of Moorhead State College, it is my privilege to welcome you, the freshman class of 1955, to the campus. Having enrolled here only last year myself, as president, I am only one year ahead of you and hopefully we can grow, mature, and learn together. Joining me in extend, extending the hand of fellowship as you become part of our campus community is my roommate, Manon. <laughs> your mamas and your papas have entrusted us with your very lives for these next four years. They want us to make a good citizen out of you each and every one of you. Manon and I hear this over and over as we travel from Moorhead to Maysville, to Vanceburg, to Greenup, to Ashland, to Inez, to West Van Leer, Belfry, Phelps, Cumberland, Frenchburg, Flemingsburg, and on and on and on. As a matter of fact, we saw many of you at one of the 23 commencement addresses I made last year. Your parents told me they had some rules for you at home. Well, we have some rules for you here. <laughs> so as you begin this new year, this venture into the unknown, you should be aware that you are expected to stay away from Clack Mountain, <laughs> the clock, and the drive around. <laughs> Dean Lappin and I would like to be able to tell the boys from the girls. <laughs> so you boys are not expected to wear that long, unattractive hair. Cultured young gentlemen always wear socks. And as Dean Roger Wilson will tell you later on this morning, don't let me catch you throwing your beer cans on the boulevard. <laughs> One more thing about rules. This is our college, and these are our rules. When you get your college, you can have your rules. <laughs> And if you don't like our rules, <laughs> we have a bus going east, and we have a bus going west every six hours. And you can be on either one of those. Before I release you to Dean Wilson, I want each of you to take a moment and look to your right 
and look to your left. Remember, one of you three will not be here next year. Will you be the missing person? In closing, Manon and I want you to know that our doors are always open to you, office or home. Manon says, just don't smoke in either place. <laughs> Some of you are aware that uh, Ann and I were just recently married. As a matter of fact, Dr. Ms. Dorn participated in the wedding and the, the music was provided by our dear friends from here at Moorhead. <clears throat> we just returned from a wonderful honeymoon in Turkey and Greece. During our trip, we sailed the Aegean Sea to several spectacular islands around the mainland of Greece and had an opportunity to spend a considerable amount of time in both Ephesus and Athens. Visiting these ancient places truly, truly makes a person reflect on the history of man and his accomplishments in this world. As you know, when we in the United States think about history, we think of Columbus, Plymouth Rock, and frontiersmen in covered wagons going to California over the Oregon Trail, all in the past 500 years. Ephesus was settled in 2000 BC. The ruins of both places are overwhelming. St. John, the writer of the Gospel and the book of Revelation in the New Testament, lived, died, and was buried there. The hillside theater there provokes memories of Paul, who, who lived in Ephesus and preached there on a lot of many occasions. In Athens, the rock, the sacred rock of the Apocalypse is Acropolis it dominates the landscape and, and it dominates all the modern architectural imitations that have followed. The limestone foundations of the Parthenon rise from the highest point on the rock of the Acropolis and nearby is Mars Hill, uh, where Paul uh, first preached Christianity to the Athenians. The Finks was the site of the open assembly of the Athenians, where statesmen such as Pericles and Aristides uh, delivered their orations. My mother reminded me that uh, Jesse Stewart wrote a book entitled uh, Dandelions on the Acropolis. And uh, she said that when she was there several years ago, she actually found a dandelion on the uh, uh, Parthenon. I had my own unique experience as I walked across the ruins at Ephesus and the Parthenon. In those places, I saw Adrian Dorn. I could see him debating the Greeks on all the important issues of the day. I could see him with Pericles and Aristides and fielding the questions of Socrates and Plato. I could see him preaching alongside Paul and writing alongside John. There is no doubt in my mind that regardless of the decade or the era, Adrian Dorn would stand beside, side by side with those who have influenced political philosophy and religion for all Western civilization. Dr. Dorn is truly a man for all ages. And it is an honor for me to participate today. Thank you very much. Your program identifies our next presenter as a songwriter, <clears throat> but she also is a singer and a movie actress. We are proud to welcome her here from Nashville, Miss Lisa Pallas. My dear Aunt Nani and our beloved guest of honor, your buddy, Nancy Thornberry, who also happens to be my mother, and I wrote a song for this special occasion. She wishes she could be here with you today, but you know that she's here in song and in spirit. Now, Unc, you have, you have followed many callings in your life. You've worn many hats, and you've answered to many names. Your given name of Adrian, 
Your nickname on the high school basketball team of Stiff, I just found that one out a couple of days ago. <laughs> You've answered to Mr. Doran, to Coach, to Dr. Doran, to Brother Doran, to President Doran, to Mr. Speaker, to Papa, to Unc, and we can only imagine all the terms of endearment that Aunt Nani calls you when the rest of us aren't around. <laughs> but there's one that's always been my favorite and always will be my favorite because when I hear it, it always sounds strong and sure, just like you. Jay? Hey, Big A, it's your day. And we've all come to celebrate. Gathered here to praise you for your 90 years of life, for your faith and years of service through the good times and the strife, for your partnership with Nani who has made the perfect wife. Hey, Big A, it's your day. Our mere words could not describe how you have touched so many lives. From your early days at Cuba, to the Murray Racers yell, to UK for higher learning, and you did it all so well. Teaching school and preaching Sundays, and as the history books would tell, you have touched so many lives. And we thank you for your kindness and compassion we admire you for your leadership and might for your courage and conviction in setting all things right for the years of inspiration that kept our futures bright Hey, Big A, it's your day. And we wish for you the best. May the millennium treat you kindly with wondrous things in score. Kentucky needs your greatness for at least a decade more. We love you and we honor you beyond the highest score. Hey, Big A, it's your day. Everybody. Hey, Big A, it's your day. one other speaker today who could not make it so I want to say what I plan to say and then what I will say I plan to say you watched him on the gridiron and now we watch him on ESPN and he came here from Alabama by way of Connecticut and as part of the MSU Athletic Hall of Famer Mike Gottfried unfortunately all those plane connections didn't work. But Mike couldn't make it, so he sent his better half, really, and I think we're going to be very pleased with her. 
Mickey Gottfried. Mickey? Thank you very much, Dr. Aiklin, Mrs. Aiklin, and Dr. Doran and Manon. Knowing Mike as you do, you know if it were at all possible, he would be here today. So please allow me to, look, to read to you the words that he sent. My heart's desire was to be here today. However, ESPN decided that the Thursday night show and early starting time on Saturday game, I would be jeopardizing being to the game site in Virginia on time. My thoughts will be with all of you here today, and especially the Dorans. Happy birthday, Dr. Doran. When I think of you, I am reminded that Psalm 37 says that the steps of a good man, a person in right relationship with God, are ordered by the Lord. Dr. Dorn, you and Manon, your steps have been ordered, and you have been great role models for all the students and teachers that walk through Moorhead. You have touched so many people with your life. When I went through the Catholic school in Crestline, Ohio, I was taught, live a life of honesty, be humble, represent the Lord in everything you do, live a life so that when it ends, on the moment you meet God, you will hear these words, well done, my son. I say this to you, Dr. Doran, thank you from the bottom of my heart for all have you, you have done for so many of us. Thank you for your leadership, your strength, and for being a role model as a husband, as an educator, as a friend, as a mentor, and most importantly, as a godly man. I have been blessed by having you in my life. I love you. And I know that it will be said to you, well done, my good and faithful servant. Thank you, Dr. Dorn and Manon, and happy birthday. <coughs> The next person on the program is a singer. He also has a day job as a top neurosurgeon. <laughs> he is going to lead us in singing Happy Birthday. Please greet Dr. Phil Tibbs. Are you ready for this? Uh, I'm, a, I'm a newcomer to the family of people who love and admire the Dorans. And, and although I've been coming to Moorhead for a couple of times a month for 20 years up at the Cape Friend Clinic representing the University of Kentucky, and although I've treated many people in this community, um, many of whom I see out there today, I, I hadn't had the privilege of meeting uh, Dr. Doran until he himself was ill uh, two years ago, <coughs> actually last year about this time, uh, when he had sciatica and a pinched nerve and a weak leg. and. Uh, you get to know a person pretty well when they're sick and how they handle adversity. And I have to say that, uh, that uh, yeah, he handled it very well, and not only then a year ago, but uh, recently. A year ago, I was making rounds, and uh, Manana told me that, that uh, it was his birthday coming up, his 89th birthday, and uh, we arranged for a cake to be delivered, and we had some flowers delivered, and of course, he had lots of friends. And, and uh, I was making rounds, and he was in the bathroom when I was making rounds. So uh, uh, Manan and I winked, winked at each other, and we went into the bathroom, and there he was standing in his pajamas with a fresh scar on his back, and we sang a lusty happy birthday, <laughs> which he enjoyed immensely then and has talked about. Well, this year, unfortunately, uh, as you know, Dr. Gorham was ill, and, and uh, this event had to be delayed, and he again showed a lot of heroism, the same type of attitude that I now know he brought to all of the endeavors that he uh, tackled in his life. And he is, uh, despite this hip fracture, he's uh, rehabilitating himself and just looks marvelous, the same guy. But uh, this year I wasn't able to be at the day, at, the, at your room the day of the, uh, of the birthday, so I've been to Moorhead all day and I had a recruiting dinner for a new faculty member and I was 
said to myself as I was running into the restaurant about 8 o'clock at night, I haven't sang my song to Dr. Doran. So I got out my cell phone in the middle of the parking lot. There must have been 20 people standing around me. I sang, happy birthday. <laughs> they all thought I was nuts, which I probably am. But uh, I've been privileged to meet two of the, the absolute finest people I've ever met. And, and as a couple, you can see how, how much yeah, each member of a, a marriage can mean to each other. And uh, um, I love you. My wife, Trudy, is here. She loves you as well. And I want to lead a, a round of happy birthday. And I want to tell you, I, I don't want any w wimpy, limp uh, <laughs> versions of happy birthday. What I want is a lusty, robust version that will, will set the occasion and reflect the service that Dr. Doran has been to you all. So can we have a little uh, arpeggio there from the, from the pe piano? <laughs> Ready? Oh, come on. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Dr. Doran. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Wonderful. Maybe I should have had him operated on me. I would have got at least a birthday song <laughs> and no infection. <laughs> you've heard good things about our honoree from this podium, and you've probably read all those wonderful birthday messages in the program, including one from Ted Kennedy that didn't actually get in. And uh, it, might have, it might have been given out separately. I don't know, but he a, wrote a beautiful letter uh, to Adrian. Now we're going to hear the real story behind this man. I want his gracious lady to know that her personal development institute is alive and well in its 30th year with over 150 students in it this time. So it's still going on. The woman who first exemplified the term first lady on this beautiful campus, the beautiful Mrs. Menondorn. Thank you, President Eaglin, Bonnie. My warmest, warmest, heartfelt greetings to every one of you that are here today. I know that many of you have come a great distance to join us, and we appreciate it. But believe you me, it's a hard act to follow what has already been. At this time, I'm almost filled to the brim with emotions and tears and happiness with a few heartaches in between. Thank you all for what you have already done and said. It would be just a plenty if I didn't say anything. But one of my dear friends, one of my dearest friends, when I was talking to her about the Keith had told me about the last minute that I was expected to say something or do something. And I said, Keith, I can't. I just can't this time. He said, you have to. <laughs> so yesterday afternoon, I jotted down a few little things that I thought I might say. And I read them over the phone to a friend of mine, a very, very good friend, that would tell me exactly what she thinks. And she said, Nani, that's just great. Read what you've written. If you don't, you'll ramble. <laughs> and says, what you have written sounds really good, and I think it's better than what you'd ramble. <laughs> so I'm going to read what I jotted down lest I do what my friend said I might do. My A, from 1931 to 1999. Oh, why did those years go so quickly? 
And where did they go? A and I have been partners and in love for lo these short 68 years. We are blessed, so blessed, to still have each other. We have known and always practiced the importance of couplehood. We have learned each other's limitations. We've learned to live with each other's idiosyncrasies and accept them. Our relationship has always been exceptionally, especially strong. We've been partners. We're grateful, so grateful, for having this long life together. And during this period, having the opportunity to amass a multitude of friends represented here today. Thank you for being here. Yes, A and I are drinking from the saucer because our cup is running over. Paraphrasing a card that the A received during this convalescent period sort of expresses both of our sentiments. It says, we still find each day too short for all the thoughts we want to think, all the walks we want to take, all the books we want to read, and all the friends we want to see." Unquote. We thank God for his love in abundance that brightens our lives with countless blessings like having this beautiful occasion today provided for us. Thank you, Bonnie and Ronnie, and all of the staff that made it possible. My A in 19, from 1931 to 1999, I've always, I rely on A and have always for just about everything. Even for my basic nourishment, activity. I guess if I were not married to him, I probably would put a vending machine in the kitchen and I'd live on hot dogs and potato chips. <laughs> but I try to feed him nourishing food. A has always seemed not to know the meaning of fear or depression. He always seems unafraid and strong and sort of hard-headed sometimes. <laughs> but he has the answers, and most of the time they're right. Sometimes they're not the ones I would have given, or at least not in the manner in which I would have given them. But he did get his point across. <laughs> but bless his heart, he's always been able to soar above trivia. He's learned the difference between trivia and importance. And I haven't. I still dwell on trivia. And up till a few weeks ago, he dwelt on the important, but now I'm doing trivia and the important too. <laughs> A is R-E-A-L, real, goods, real goods, no foe. He never faked anything. A and R trying, we are both trying hard to accept and realize that with aging, we have to expect and face up to certain physical deterioration, lifestyle changes, maybe even humiliating, a bit demoralizing at times. However, as we journey down the road, it can be made more enjoyable and more interesting if we take a day at a time and go with the flow and try to let go of our regrets 
and try to sorrow less of our aging and physical changes. We will always be mindful and grateful, never forgetting all the blessings that have crowned our days. Yes, Jenny, gratitude. Despite some setbacks, despite some hardships, I have always known that love, laughter, friendship, and godliness brings us and helps us keep closer to one another. Now, your birthday greeting, A, eh, to my precious husband on his special day, and he better be listening to me instead of writing his speech. <laughs> to my precious... To my precious husband, I'll start over, forget that. <laughs> On his special day with all my love. Listen, here it is. Being married to you for 68 years has been the best thing that ever happened to me. You've been my partner, my lover, my counselor, and my dearest friend. Knowing that I have your love lets me face life challenges secure in the knowledge that I have someone special who thinks about me, who supports me, and cares for me more deeply than anyone else. I'm so thankful to have been and to be sharing life with you. I need you, and I love you with all my heart. My original little verse as I close. A, this comes to you to bring you cheer, to be thankful for another year. Oh, may your day be filled with bliss. From both of us, let's share a kiss. Glad I got you, babe. <laughs> Happy birthday. I thought Bonnie was the only person to say, now listen. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Dorn and I have discussed on many occasions the differences between the university president of the 90s and the expectations of presidents in the 60s and 70s. There are great commonalities, but there certainly are some distances. This institution was very fortunate to have this man as its president at the right time, to bring understanding to the journalism and vital importance of regional universities. And you've heard others talk about his tireless effort to, per to persuade parents to entrust their children to this institution. He was persuasive, and if you've seen the results, not only on this campus, but all regional universities. Many of you are aware that the General Assembly has created a new program which allows our public institutions to raise funds for various endowments and have them matched dollar for dollar by the state. The ones that you read about and from the leadership of Dr. Brethett and others are really the hundred million dollars that have gone to the University of Louisville and to the University of Kentucky. But also in that bill was an allowance for regional universities to create endowments. This is a wonderful program and we're most grateful to Governor Paul Patton and the legislature for their foresight and leadership in allowing us to build endowments that will help future generations of students. 
As we looked at the opportunity and what it could mean for the future of Moorhead State University, it was obvious for me that our first major endowment should bear the honorable name of the man who came to these hills more than 45 years ago and had really the most impact on this institution, I think, since its founder over 112 years ago. Certainly, his legacy will be remembered, and history will show that he was probably and will continue to be the most influential president this university has ever had. And it was clear that our original mission, and perhaps our most important mission even today, that of educating teachers, should be the beneficiary of that first endowment. Now, in order to create this endowment, we looked to someone to lead a quiet yet what I thought was an ambitious fundraising campaign to raise $125,000 to be matched by the state that would give us a quarter of a million dollar endowment. Due to the generosity of just three entities, we surpassed that first goal immediately. In order to help raise these types of funds, we had looked to someone within. And we found that just as he had done for the MSU as its chief financial officer in the Dorn years, he would be the person for the job. And I want him to be recognized as we now make this presentation, uh, Mr. Russ McClure, who has led that campaign. Russ, thank you. Now, before he turns this check around, this, we couldn't keep up because donations came in uh, when we first had the check printed. And I don't even know what the final amount is. So I'm going to hold it. He's going to, we're going to be dramatic here. We're going to write the number on this check. Well, no, we're going to be dramatic. We'll go, we'll go down there. <laughs> we're going to be get down here. We're going to be real dramatic. Okay. Well, Dr. Dorn, before I go down away from the mic. Oh, let me carry that. Wait. <laughs> no. Dr. Dorn, it's not for you to keep, but it's... <laughs> As, uh, as one of your Chidwin and, and Brucine is one of your Chidwin and all these Chidwin out here and on behalf of them we were pleased to honor you and let me revise this to $530,000. Oh. I did find out one thing. It's a lot easier to raise money when you're vice president of the university or secretary of finance and you can hold people's checks. So I lost the leverage of being able to do that, but thank you all for participating. <laughs> Bye. This endowment will be known as the Adrian Dorn Endowment for Educational Leadership. As many of you... As many of you know, uh, Moorhead State University has taken the leadership in looking at our teacher education program to make it uh, right, as we should say, for the new millennium. And some 50 faculty members are working very hard moving us in that direction. And this particular endowment, I think, is appropriately named for the right person because it will provide the types of funds to ensure that we can complete the job of improving and continuing to improve education in our region. The gifts and pledges came, as I said, faster, and, and I am so pleased. I don't know if you heard the amount. It was $530,000. Happy birthday, Mr. President. We've said in the program that we feel in our hearts about this man. He is 90 years young. And I believe that qualifies him to be a living legend. I give you President Emeritus Adrian Dorn.
necessities. But I sit at the table today and instead of standing in the podium. And if you can hear me uh, in the audience, I'll sit here. <laughs> you could have said closer, and I know. <laughs> In all this check represents twice as much money as the state appropriated to Morehead State University the first year I was here. We had $250,000 from the state. I couldn't raise money. Ross McClure was too busy doing nothing to get out. <laughs> and we suffered through those days <laughs> the <very> best we <laughs> My friend, this is the most astonishing <laughs> and astounding and moving thing that I have ever known to happen to anybody, and certainly to happen to me. When the Horatio Alger Committee gave me an award at the Horatio, or at the, uh, what is it, the Waldorf, uh, Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York a few years ago, that represented an individual who had come from rags to riches. I said then, I suppose, I'm the first one who's ever received this award that's still in rags. <laughs> and I'm still in rags compared with such awards and recognition and respect and regard <laughs> as this uh, award uh, represents. And to know that some young people, some yet unborn, will enjoy the fruits of your labors who have contributed to this uh, poem when you come to Moorhead State University to, to study under the established leadership program. And if anybody could say anything about me that would be pleasing beyond <coughs> expression, it would be that he was a pretty good leader. I didn't follow very well. <laughs> But I knew where we were going, and I knew what it took to get there. And I knew where to go to get some of the things that were necessary to put us there. And I appreciate your recognition of that. Now, I've made a lot of speeches in this room. A lot of speeches on this campus. Some of them have been misquoted today. <laughs> I wish I had said some of the things. <laughs> but this is the greatest gathering of personal, loyal, kind, loving and generous people that have ever met in my behalf for any person. And when you see an auditorium which we built here in name for Buford Crager, one of the young leaders uh, of this university, 
in a building bearing my own name. <coughs> what more could an individual expect in his life? And I had to live 90 years <laughs> to get that point. <laughs> I wouldn't throw one of those years away because it has meant uh, so much to me. And so you are friends, you are relatives, you are Kentuckians, you are Americans all. Now the reason I'm not speaking any better than I am today because uh, beginning with Dr. Teals <laughs> on the 25th day of August 1998, I have had four anesthesias and I have had four water holes run down my throat. <laughs> I did not know then, I do not know why then. <laughs> but I have not recovered from them, I'll tell you who is the fullest. One of the interesting things about that you'll be interested in, when uh, Dr. Tibbs operated on me for spinal stenosis and for relief from a serious uh, pinching of the sciatica nerve. He said, I haven't done enough for to him. I don't know anything else to do to him. Let's see if we can get a catheter in his bladder. <laughs> <laughs> Caruso worked at the job, <laughs> but he found out he couldn't get it in there, and he called Dr. McRoberts. He said, I want you to come down here and put this catheter in his bladder. I can't get it. <laughs> so he worked on it. I don't know. I was asleep. <laughs> and uh, finally, he got it in. Drained it pretty well. <laughs> and then he uh, turned around and went through my prostate. I was found flat on his back. Already been operated for five hours, and he'd investigate his prostate. <laughs> but Mike Roberts did. He could not stand the pressure in being here today. <laughs> he found it full of cancer cells and got them all out, and thank God I, I'm well of that. He later found a former uh, operation had caused uh, scar tissue. He went back in there the third time and took the scar tissue out. And then uh, I was foolish enough to fall off of the sidewalk downtown in Lexington where I had gone to the county court clerk, ironically, to get a tag that showed I could park in a, in a restricted <laughs> to the old boy about whether he deserved that parking ticket, but I fell and broke my leg and broke my hip, and now I'm sitting. I lay for a long time. I'm now sitting, and it won't be long until I'll be, uh, I'll be walking again. But the
kid is it today stagger me. Now, for you all to quit what you've been doing, or some of you wouldn't have been doing anything. <laughs> to come here today to this, uh, this, uh, this uh, luncheon is, uh, is beyond, uh, beyond comprehension. I've estimated there are 500 of you. I'm a little given to exaggeration. <laughs> Jenny, I believe there are 500 people here and let's go abroad and tell. <laughs> It could only happen for Adrian Doran at Moorhead State University. There's not an institution in this land who have enough friends and who regard its president uh, pro tem. Not pro tem. <laughs> president Emeritus. <laughs> That's one thing that's still wrong with me. I can't remember words that I ought to remember, and I remember words that I ought not to remember. Himself has said, This is my own, my native land. It is my native land. It's your late native land. And because it is, that's why we think so much of each other and show love and respect and compassion toward each other and to each other. When one, uh, one, one loves the other. There are dear friends from all over the land here today. I want to take the opportunity to mention some of them. I can't get to all of you because you're all as important as the others. But I suppose Patsy and Mark Whitson have come the farthest from California. Anybody farther than California? Well, you'll drown if you go any farther than that. <laughs> there are other special individuals that they are special. Our family sitting at this table are Troy Burgess, Joe McLean and his wife Jenny and uh, Ann, Davis. Ann Davis McLean. She's new to us because she's new in the family. And I ponder a little. And Ann and uh, Harold Orr. These are our nieces and nephews and these are our cousins, but we don't know the difference in them. <laughs> They're so binding and, uh, and loving to us. Then besides this family, there are two other families that I want you to look at. One of them is the Citizen Bank here at this table and over at another table. They are as dearly to us as our own family is dearly to us. <laughs> At the other table here to my right is the other close-knit family with us. It is the board of directors of the Heritage Life Insurance Company, the posterity of my dearest friend, Haley Waterfield. And if I had to lose a whole group of individuals at the same time, to lose these two groups 
would be one of the great disasters in my life. The Citizens Bank and its employees, the human, the Heritage Life Insurance Company and its employees. <clears throat> but I don't think I ever had the privilege of uh, being honored by so many governors. Did you know there are three governors here today? Why, you couldn't get three governors to a go rope <laughs> I doubt if either one of them ever saw a go rope <laughs> They've already been introduced, except Governor Brereton, Jones, and Libby. I knew Ned Breathitt's wife when he was a when she was a high school girl. We knew Ned when he was a college student. We knew Libby when she was a, a, a teenager and the daughter of our dear friend, Arthur Lloyd. Lloyd. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> <laughs> no, and Ned came to see me the other day. When those two come at the same time, <laughs> it's hard as the Dickens to tell what you're in for. <laughs> oh, it was a delightful hour they spent with us. We talked about everything, and they reviewed things that were impressions of theirs, of me, that I didn't know they even knew, let alone were impressed. <laughs> But when they got ready to leave, I said, now I want both of you to be at Moorhead on the 15th of October. Well, I said, I'm going to be there. <coughs> Ned said, oh, I've got an appointment as chairman of some great organization for <coughs> international affairs, and I, I must go there. And I said, uh, Ned, let me, let me warn you. If you don't go, I'm not going to say anything about you. I'm going to say it all about Lewis. <laughs> he said, uh, I'm going to cancel that appointment. <laughs> they were dear friends of mine when I was president here for 23 years. I miss Brereton, he came on late. But uh, he picked up some of the footprints along the way that others had made and made himself. He was a great governor too. There are representative senators in the audience. There is a former representative, former uh, president and his wife here. This, this constitutes confidence, high regard, deep respect that I have for you. You love me and, uh, and I love you. There are two of the people here who have helped me more since retirement than I could tell you. One of them is Winston uh, Moore. Moore of Nashville, Tennessee. He is the vice president of the 21st Century Publishing Company. He's here with his wife. I'm afraid they won't see you, Stan, and see your pretty wife if you don't stand up. <laughs> he uh, published my latest book, on the restoration of Christianity and did it as a labor of love to make any money out of it. Sure, I didn't want to. Where is Basil Overton? Yeah. Basil Overton and his wife Marge. Basil is the editor and publisher of the World Evangelist in Florence, Alabama. He was the first one who came to me and said, now you're not going to sit around and, and uh, smoke a pipe and blubber all over yourself. 
He said, I want you to add, I want to add you to my staff, and I want you to start research and uh, writing and lectures on the American Restoration Movement. I did that 23 years ago, and he's published everything I've written and then some influenced some others to do. Marge, you and Bates will stand up and take a greedy from this time on. I graduated from high school. I went to Freed Hardeman University in Henderson, Tennessee. And uh, the dean of that school was C.P. Rowland. Great friend, great man, great teacher. And his son is here today, Charles P. Rowland. And Charles P. was a a uh, grade student when I was a freshman in college. But I want you to see what a fellow looks like who's lived pretty near as long as I have. <laughs> <laughs> Charles P. Rowland and his wife, Hallelujah. Charles, where are you? Don't tell you got weak knees in the left. <laughs> He's just bashful. He's a professor of history at the University of Kentucky, and he doesn't get to show his face around there very often, and he didn't think he'd be called on here. Well, that's bad. Now, I would not propose, I think, to tell you what I think of the doctors who operated on me, and I've had a rough time for a year, I tell you. The, head, the skin is bare in a lot of places, even <laughs> on my heel, because I lay in the bed so long. I can't pay enough tribute to these who have watched over and cared for me so well and have me on the way to recovery. I don't want to close recognition by forgetting Jenny Pence the daughter of uh, Governor Louis Nunn. She's a great friend of Manon. She was a, Manon was a great friend of her mother. And I appreciate you stealing away to be with us today. Love you. But I'm not going to try to match Manon's speech. <laughs> I couldn't say enough about myself to equal what she <laughs> Then I didn't know that much about her. I didn't know that much about myself. But really, when we get home, pull off our shoes, sit in our easy chair, and uh, I'm going to ask her to read that thing to me again. <laughs> would be a great rereading of uh, what she has said. But what I would say about Manon, you already know. And if I said something contradictory to what you know, you'd all rise up with one, with one voice booing me for doing it. And I could not strengthen your regard and your respect and your devotion to her for what she has already done and what you know that I have known uh, that she has done uh, for me. And let it be that all of the people who have stood by me, hand in hand and shoulder in shoulder and step by step, has been my beloved Manon in all of the way. She was my classmate in Murray State University. She became my roommate while we were still in college. But let me hasten some of you, uh, <laughs> some of you people, that before she became my roommate, we got married. <laughs> That's what everybody else ought to do before you start doing 
Well, that's another short. <laughs> you know, I, we, I, I came to Moorhead in 1954. That's 45 years ago. That's half of my life. Half of the 90 years that I've lived, we have spent on the campus are connected directly through the good graces of Ron and Bonnie Eaglin with this great institution. I don't know of one that I could have chosen that would have been, would have been better. But our arrival on this campus 45 years ago by the way of a little two-lane road, Highway 60 that came in here was not very discouraging, I tell you. And as I look back on it, I almost weep that we had decided to dedicate our lives to as deeply depressed and deprived an underdeveloped institution as this one was within an Appalachia region bearing the same kind of marks. But we rolled up our sleeves, as Baritone Jones said when he was running for governor, and went to work. We worked hard, you worked hard. I didn't have Terry in my office and as many times as he sounded. <laughs> many times he was there, he was helping me organize the students of this university to make a good college. All of those things have modified themselves. There were 800 students here that day. There were 8,000 students when we pulled up and retired and, uh, and left, uh, left the campus. But I want to say to you, we worked hard to do what we did here. You worked hard to help us do it. But I want to tell you, you need not be a fear, afraid of Ronald Eaglin and Bonnie Eaglin in continuing this university at the very highest level that you'll help them go. <laughs> They've got more ideas than a dog has fleas. <laughs> and they can put them into effect and you can help them put it in effect. And don't, uh, don't ponder. Let me close in saying to you, that in my opinion, we had a big 80th AD, we had a big 90th AD, but I doubt if we have a 100th AD. Keith Caper says he's planning for it, but I think he's just wishful thinking. I expect this will be the last big meeting, the big revival, the big evangelist gathering that I will be the central part of until the last ties are broken and the last uh, arrangements to depart this life have been made. And we come to the time in which you will make a big to-do, won't you? Over my <laughs> I say to you in closing, when you come to bury me, tuck me to sleep in my old tucky hole. Cover me with skies so blue. Leave me there alone. Let the sun kiss my cheeks. Like the kisses I've been missing since my mama left us. 
taught me to sleep in my old tucky home. Let me lay there, stay there, never more to roam. Your prayers have been greater influence than you realize. Some of you did not know that you knew me when you called on him. Some of them didn't know you when you called on him. You had to explain the calling on him. I say now we wouldn't we haven't bothered you much in our prayer in the past. <coughs> and we wouldn't bother you now. But old Dolan is an awful sick man and he needs your help. And you called on him and he did. And I want to thank you for it. And I want you to thank one another for it. And I want you to keep on loving one another and keep on letting me love you until you do tuck me to sleep in my old tucker home. Thank you.
kiss. Glad I got you, babe. <laughs> Happy birthday. And I want you to keep on loving one another and keep on letting me love you until you do tuck me to sleep in my old tucky home. <laughs>